Console hacking has to be involved on a console. Uh, I like getting console har hardware interface to my computer, so why the hell not? In my hands, I have a PlayStation 2 iToy USB webcam. Now, you can get this working under Windows, Linux, and OS X. Now, if you're working under Linux and OS X, I'll assume that all you really needed to know is that the PlayStation 2 iToy works. If you're running Windows, you probably need a little bit more help seeing that you're running Windows. Plus, for the most part, most of us run Windows anyway. Now, why would you want to get one of these things? Well, one, they're really cheap nowadays. Uh, I get mine between six and eight dollars at the used video game stores. Uh, I think you can get them for about twelve to fifteen dollars online. Uh, reason number two, it actually, actually has a built-in microphone, so if you're doing it for any kind of voice or video conferencing, you don't even need to wear a microphone. Uh, another thing I like about it, it has manual focus on the front and it's got very nice focus. It works relatively well on low light, which is a very big problem I've had if you notice in a lot of the earlier episodes that uh, when I was using my older camera, everything looked too dark, and even that was even with lighting. Like right now, I've got lights up, and it's still too dark in here. I just don't like a lot of bright lights. This works relatively okay in low light. And on the front, there's a blue LED and a red LED. The blue LED shows you that it's plugged in, and it's actually working and synced with your computer. The red LED shows you that it's actually active and currently probably recording or otherwise in use. Now, most people don't like that feature. I like it primarily because, you know, Sometimes I'll be on a video conference and, you know, some one of my friend's wives or girlfriends that are extremely obese walks through without a top on. I don't want to see that shit. I really don't. You know, God forbid, you know, your computer gets attacked, viral, you know, VNC exploit, you know, what have you, and they turn on your camera and you don't know. You have no idea what kind of footage you're going to get of you, so typically I put something over my camera so I know that it's, you know, even if you did get in, you're not going to see anything. But with this, you can also see a nice big red LED showing that it is recording. So if people don't want to be in the background of whatever you're video conferencing, they know when the red light's on, stay away from the camera. So, all right, so we're going to get to the PC side. This is actually fairly easy. Uh, you can actually go online and just download the pre-hacked drivers. There's really not much to it, but I like doing things myself. Let's go to the PC side and get this thing working. The first thing you want to do is get your ass to google.com and look for the PlayStation 2 or PS2 iToy driver. There's a lot of information online, and we're just going to go to the first result that we've got, and it's Anders Jacobson's blog, and he has an in-detail tutorial on exactly what you need to do. I'm not really going to cover it if you have the intelligence of a fourth grader, and any way you can read, you should be able to follow this word for word, fully illustrated. He explains that this is actually based off of a D-Link DSB C310 uh, Omnivision series webcam. You can get the drivers from the D-Link FTP, driver FTP. You go about and you extract the drivers to whatever folder you want to on your desktop. Load the driver file, which is ov519.inf into WordPad, which I've already done. And using file, replace, or hitting control H on your keyboard, you can go ahead and replace certain values with other values. As explained, you're going to have to either replace it with, uh, you're going to have to replace key VID underscore 05A9 ampersand PID underscore 8519 with one of two alternate values depending on whether you have either a Logitech or a Namtai hardware. So once you go ahead and do that, save your drivers, go ahead and install them. Now, they have uh, this uh, amcap.exe which will allow you to test the webcam. So once you go you can hit devices, go to the iToy, and now you can see the iToy. And using the manual focus, you can either get a really nice close-up shot or you can get a nice pull-out shot. Now, going back to the actual camera for a second, like as, as I've stated, it's got the red LED showing that it's actually recording, and it's got the blue LED to show that it's actually on and working. So, 
Uh, this takes all about maybe five minutes to do. I see no reason why not to. If you can find an eye toy, go for it. I uh, hope this was informational in the least. And if you have any questions or comments, you can always hit Google. You can always catch me on IRC or on the forums, or I'll put some links in the show notes. really isn't much to this, so meh. Have fun. Howdy, y'all. Uggster here. Uh, you're probably wondering why I'm out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, to tell you the truth, I really don't know. But anyway, today I'd like to go over a program called Orb. Uh, unlike my previous segments, this is applicable to desktop PCs as well as laptops. It's not just limited to this. Um, Orb is a media streaming server, basically. So it's a program you put on your computer, you point it where all your files are, and it'll stream them over the internet through your uh, cable or DSL connection to uh, supported devices. And that would be smartphones, obviously, because I probably wouldn't be using it if it didn't support smartphones. Uh, any internet connected computer or laptop, so you can basically access your music, pictures, videos, documents, just about everything over the internet, wherever you are around the world, as long as you have a decent connection. Um, it can also be used for streaming live TV if your computer has a supported TV tuner card. That's been something that's been a bitch to, to, for me to configure properly, and uh, I just recently got it working because I'm using a 10-year-old uh, PCI TV tuner card, um, and I'm using two separate sound cards because one of them works in Orb, the other doesn't, and one won't stream. It's a, it's a mess, whatever. So getting it configured properly can be a pain, but once you do, it's, it's actually pretty cool to have TV like wherever you go. Um, so I'm going to go over the computer side and show you how to install Orb, and then I'll show you some uh, practical applications. Where's my computer? Okay, here's how to download and install Orb on your computer. Uh, the website's www.orb.com. Hit the download section and pick the appropriate download for your country. I was wrong, there, there are TV guides for a bunch of different countries, so yeah, awesome. Just download the one that's appropriate to your country for the program guide, otherwise it's the same executable. Don't click it, and be their bull crap, and wait until it installs. Alright, here it'll give you a chance to select which folders you want to put on sharing and allow it to access. Uh, it'll do a system check and run through your specs and make sure that everything's up to par. Uh, you can also stream to your Xbox 360, or uh, more recently you can also stream to the Wii, but we won't get into that today. And that's it. Once Orb is installed, you can configure it by right-clicking and hitting Configuration. There's a crap load of options here, most of which you probably won't need to screw with. The advanced tab allows you to change your port settings and codecs. Uh, I usually leave everything on default, but if you're having issues, this is a fir first place to look. The media tab allows you to choose which folders you want to be available on Orb, and yeah, that's pretty self-explanatory. TV tab allows you to set up your TV tuner card, uh, program guide, as well as webcams. Orb has a feature called Orb Secure, which is like a cheap home security system. It'll find any working webcams on your computer, and when it detects motion, it will take pictures or video and notify you of that. It's pretty cool. So, set up TV signal and provider. This also works with set-top boxes. You can choose, you know, coaxial composite S video, but you need an IR blaster to actually change the channel, so that kind of limits usability. Um, other than that, it's just setting up your program guide and, and getting those settings right, and that's it. Alright, once you have everything configured, open up a browser and go to mycast.orb.com. Once you log in, you'll be presented with this page. The open application tab is where you'll find most of your crap and whatever you need. Uh, you can go to the control panel for some in-detail settings. If you're having streaming issues, you can set a specific upload speed for your computer. Um, different skins. There's a couple different ones. One of them looks really good, especially on, if you're using like a home theater PC or something. Um, if you're having hardware issues, go to TV webcams. This will show all of your connected devices. Uh, you just gotta poke around. If if you're having an issue with something, check here. I'm sure there's a there's a fix for it. Uh, so that's it. I mean, it's pretty simple to set up and use unless you run into terrible hardware issues like I always do. Um, it's a really powerful tool if you're really into listening to your music on the go and you don't happen to have a device that can store large amounts of audio but can connect to the internet. Uh, I happen to be in that position, so I find this program useful and I hope you do too.
Okay, so once that nightmare is over, uh, it's pretty easy to use. It has a simple to use web interface, and there's a couple different themes to choose from. Uh, uh, to play TV, <laughs> you just navigate to TV, and then you go over to the program guide, and then choose what show you want to watch. You can also re record and uh, time shift programs using Orb. It'll save it right to your hard drive. It's it's really easy to use, and it has a full like program guide for whatever uh, zip code or wherever the crap you are. I'm not sure about uh, international usability. I know it works in the US, so it sucks to be anyone else. Um, so once you get the streaming media file, it'll be like a .asx or a .ram, depending on your settings before. You'll come up with, if you were paying attention to my last segment, TCPMP should open up and you should get a streaming TV file. Well, I disagree. Well, I disagree in two respects. That's actually, uh, while some of the right people may be there, many of the wrong people are there. And I'm uh, really out in the middle of nowhere. I've got one bar and it's streaming pretty well. It's very it's very dynamic. Uh, you can choose your upload and download speeds and it's pretty simple to use. Well lately I've been spending a lot of money on USB and Firewire hard drive enclosures. Uh, the problem is is the quality just isn't that great. The power bricks on them wear out pretty fast and they cook the drives. The drives get really hot in them. I started looking in NAS boxes, but I, I kind of still want the drive portable, so I can pick it up, take it to a friend's house, or whatever, plug it into another computer, and not have this big-ass bulky box to carry around. So today, I'm going to attempt on camera, I can't make any promises, to make a six, I think, yeah, about a six-bay six USB drive enclosure. Uh, I'm basically going to make it out of this metal toolbox find them at yard sales for like a buck or two or go to a hardware store I think this one was about ten dollars whatever uh, we're gonna power it off a regular PC power supply uh, let's see I'm gonna put six drives in I'm not sure exactly how I'm gonna mount them yet I got this piece of metal from the hardware store that I can make rails to attach in it and mount it, which would give it a good amount of airflow and make it fairly easy to install the drives. Or I got these drive bays that I managed to salvage out of old computers, which would actually make the drives easier to take out and put back in, but would restrict, restrict the airflow and wouldn't look as nice in the box. So I'm not sure which method I'm going with yet. We'll see whatever works, but. If you decide to build one, you can go with either method. Uh, I didn't bring the hard drives with me, but you know what a fucking hard drive looks like. I'm going to power it off of a just a regular baby ATX power supply. No big deal. You could pull one of these out of a junk computer anywhere. To connect the drives, I got these. I put a link in the show notes where I got them from. I got these for about, I think, $8 a piece. Uh, it's USB 2.0 to either serial ATA, uh, it does 2.5 inch hard drive, the other side's 3.5 inch hard drive. It comes with these power bricks, so if you want you can use these, but I'm using the power supply because it's one wire I have to hook up and it's a much cleaner, better source of power. But if you're salvaging, it comes with this little adapter so you can go from a parallel ATA hard drive to a serial ATA power adapter. Now if you get this adapter kit and you decide to go with the power with the computer power supply like I am, just pull this off and you're probably using an old salvage power supply that doesn't have serial ATA plugs. So just put it on your power supply. Try not to break it and now you do. Uh, what else do I have? I got these red LED fans, like three bucks each. Uh, I got these fan grills just because they look cool. It's a skull and crossbones. You really don't need them, but if you want to put an extra finishing touch on them, they look kind of neat. Uh, USB hub. I only got a four, four port one here because the one that I'm ordering for this project hasn't come yet. But I'm going to put a 7-port hub in here. 
And what else did I forget? Oh, I'm thinking about possibly putting a Linksys W USB 54G USB Wi-Fi adapter on. So I got here somewhere. Uh, I think I lost it. Right? Oh, here it is. I got a panel mount end connector that I'm going to mount on this case also for future purposes. That way you can hook into Wi-Fi. That's not getting done today. So, uh, what tools are we going to need for the project? Well, basically, we need a, need a drill. Uh, I'd recommend getting a Dremel for cutting out the base. Oh, I know I forgot something. I got this 20 in one drive bay, uh, yeah, front, pa front panel, fan control, temperature sensor, memory card reader, all that bullshit. We're going to try and hook that up. Not everything in it will be hooked up, but at least we'll be able to control the speed of our fans, be able to see the temperature of the hard drives, have alarms, and have uh, front panel USB on this if you need to plug in anything extra USB, and a memory card reader. Because it's always nice to have as much as you can in such a small case for a portable device. Uh, as far as tools to put this project together, like I said, you need the drill, you need the Dremel. Uh, I picked up this hole saw kit at Harbor Depot, uh, at Harbor Freight, for I think six bucks. You need about a three inch hole saw blade to cut the holes for the fan. And I think I covered everything, if not. Anyway, we're going to cut to uh, me trying to put this thing together. I'm not sure if it's going to show up on video or not, so I might just take some still pictures of the process. And I'll show you what it looks like when I'm finished. Okay, the first step you want to do is, as you can see, I'm um, grinding off the edge on the one side. Uh, so I'll have room to mount a fan down there because that's going to get in the way. So just take your Dremel, grind it off, and eventually either you can cut all the way through it or just weaken it enough so that you can bend it off. Uh, the main thing you got to worry about is be careful about the metal splinters that come off. Uh, all the metal dust with grinding in that case, if that gets into a hard drive or your power supply, it will short something out and it won't be fun. Uh, we'll skip ahead to the next step. Now you can see, uh, basically I took the front panel, uh, temperature sensor, LCD, whatever the fuck you want to call it thing, and I traced it on the box and now we're going through with the Dremel and actually cutting a hole to put the face panel through. Uh, my fine motor skills kind of suck, so as you can see there, my wife's cutting it for me. She's actually surprisingly pretty good with the Dremel. Uh, I guess the shape of it and that it vibrates. She actually enjoys one of my power tools. But we're going to skip ahead or I'm going to speed up this video, however the editing works. And uh, we'll finish cutting out this front panel faceplate thingy. Okay, now you see we have the hole cut out for the front panel faceplate. Uh, we're just smoothing out the edges a little bit. One of the problems, though, is we accidentally cut it a little bit too big. So when you trace with a magic marker or whatever, it's, you might want to cut towards the inside of the line rather than dead center of the line. Uh, you can always go back and widen your hole later. Now, if you can see on camera what I'm doing is I got some vacuum line from the automotive store or actually I had some sitting in the back of my car and I'm just gonna cut it and hit cut put a slit down the center of it and put that over the edges not only does that smooth out the edges so they're not sharp and you won't cut yourself on it 
but it also fills in the gap so that the faceplate will fit a little bit tighter. Next step I need to do is mount the power supply in it. Now I'm using a baby ATX power supply. It fits in the case real nice. Uh, it's, it's pretty small. I believe it's 150 watts. I think that's the smallest you can get. It'll do the job. No problem. There's a little hole on the side that you can put a screw through to mount it. So I'm going to draw a hole in the side of the toolbox and use that just to mount the power supply so it doesn't move around much inside. So the last thing you want is it moving around and hitting the hard drives or something coming unplugged. Remember, this is a portable unit, so it's going to take a little bit of abuse. Okay, the next step is installing a fan. As you see, I'm putting a, just going to put the fan down. Or In this step, what I did is I put the fan down and traced the fan. Now, I kind of fucked up with that. Uh, as you see later on, I have them my uh, fan grills, them skull fan grills. It actually worked out better when I traced the fan grill and just cut out from that instead of using the whole entire fan. If you make the hole a little bit smaller than the fan, it looks a whole lot nicer. But as you see, pretty much trace the fan or the fan grill, however you feel like doing it. And draw an X along the center of it so you can see where the center point is. Drill a hole in the center, and now you're going to use that hole saw bit that I was talking about. Now, I thought that would actually cut a nice, perfect hole in the case. But apparently them bits are meant for wood and not metal, so they really didn't cut through good. But they did score it pretty good so that it gave me a good path so that we could trace it out with the Dremel and cut a nice round circular hole with the Dremel. Okay, I don't have video of this next step. Uh, somebody fucked up my camera. But uh, I took some still pictures. As you can see, I made rails to put the hard drives on. Uh, I mounted them from uh, front to back. Of the hard drive I found they fit best that way. The problem I ran into is you can only fit serial ATA drives in there. If you're using a parallel ATA drive the connector sticks out a little bit too far. So I only had one parallel ATA drive so I made a mount out of L brackets and mounted that on the lid of the case as you can see in this picture here. Next thing left to do is just run the wires. Um, I'm sure you can figure out drill a hole in the case so that you can put your power wire through and your USB cable and I personally just tied down all my wires to the to the existing rails that I put in for the hard drive uh, just run all your USB wires and your your power wires and hook up the wires on the back of the of the front panel LCD and you're pretty much done uh, sorry this video didn't turn out as good as I planned it to but like I said, my camera got knocked over and I lost quite a bit of the footage. Uh, uh, I really hope you get some use out of this. This case originally was supposed to be a six bay hard drive. And because of that parallel ATA hard drive not fitting down the bottom, that's when I got the idea to mount it to the lid to the case. So it became a seven bay hard drive. So that means this thing's capable of holding seven terabytes or more of data. That's a lot of data. A lot of people ask me, well, why would you build something that holds that much information? I mean, what would you ever use it for? My answer is, whatever the fuck I want, really. Uh, a lot of people call me a pirate or, you know, other names, stuff like that. Uh, I'm preparing for the apocalypse, and I prefer the term that I'm a digital historian. So, I hope you get some use out of this. Check the show notes. I'll try and, I should be able to pack a lot more information on the show notes. Uh, like I said, because the camera's not functioning properly right now. For the past year, we've been doing a lot of 2.4 gigahertz stuff, and unfortunately, I think this is going to be the last segment in the 2.4 gigahertz series. Now, in this segment, I want to explain wireless scanning tips and techniques. In front of me, I have a smorgasbord of equipment that we've been putting together over the year. Uh, we've got the waveguide, we've got some biquads, we've got video scanner, we have Wi-Fi cards, we have modded everything, modded Bluetooth, practically anything that's 2.4 gigahertz. Mine is Zigbee. It's pretty much the only thing I haven't showcased because it's really not that popular and no one's really asked for it. But uh, in this segment, you know, we've also got the helical, we've got the, uh, the compact collinear, 
And everything that I've built on the show over the past year is right in front of me, plus a few things that I really haven't shown on the show. Now, I understand that the frame is pulled back really far, and you can't get a good look at a lot of the equipment here, so you can always backtrack to previous segments, but some of the equipment that I have here has not been on the show. You can always go to my Picasa page. So, uh, a lot of you on IRC and on the forums have actually asked for high-quality pictures for reference on a lot of the stuff that I've built in front of me. And, you know, a picture says a thousand words. So, uh, go to my Picasa page if you have any interest in any of this kind of stuff, and you'll get actually really nice, quality, high-detailed, six-megapixel, you know, close-up images of all of this. So, um, there are three classifications of any kind of equipment, technically speaking. Now, derived from the ham radio terminology, you have either a handheld or portable, you have a mobile, and you have a base. So something handheld or portable would be something like maybe a, P a PDA or your Nintendo DS, uh, your PSP, something that can do some kind of wireless scanning. I've also got my handheld wireless scanner. This is actually made by um, Swan Technology. Um, this not, I did modify it with an antenna jack. There's not many pictures of it online, but it was a very simple modification. Uh, this really doesn't need too much documentation, but if you want some, ask and you shall receive. So those would be considered handheld devices, something that you can put in your hand, operate it with one hand, put it in your pocket, it'll sustain itself under battery life for an extended amount of time without needing an excessive recharge. So next up from there, you have a mobile. A mobile is a device that you really can't operate it from a very small battery. It needs a, a beefier battery. Like a laptop would be more like a mobile. Now I've also got some, some routers here. Now if you're not familiar with the, the Linksys WRT54 series routers, they are actually routers that can run Linux. And this router can actually act as a wireless repeater or even a wireless network card. Or within itself, coupled with a serial terminal, such as the Zipit Z1 Instant Messenger or even a TI-83 calculator, or if you have an actual handheld serial terminal, uh, the two of these together can actually be a Wi-Fi scanner, a network scanner, intrusion detection software. You can modify these to put SD cards in them so they have increased storage. They have a 250 milliwatt output range. They have removable antennas for high gain, uh, so you can put high gain antennas on it. You really can't put this in your pocket, but you can put a battery pack on, on the WRT router and put it in a bag, walk around with it, and no one will even know that you're actually scanning for Wi-Fi or doing network penetration tests network penetration tests. Uh, smaller yet are the Fonar 2100 and the 2200 routers. Uh, they were given away for very cheap, if not free, for, at some point, but then you really have to get into them and hack them. Uh, Fon has really been locking them down and it has been a bitch, but you can run, they do natively run uh, DDWRT or OpenWRT, which is an open source, relatively open source, Linux distribution, and these run the Atheros chipset meaning you can do packet injection in promiscuous mode. And at this point in time, you can actually use the phone routers to actually crack web encryption, but I'm not going to get into that. It's not the scope of today's, of today's segment. Um, so you, know, you can also use your laptop. That's more of a mobile device, as long as you have battery life and a decent antenna. Now, you can actually go about and put together a wireless video scanner, which is more of a portable than handheld which is my rifle. I don't have it put together right now, but for the most part, this is it. Um, I think I've showcased it on the show before. It's a cutout of piece of wood with a scanner. I usually put the battery pack here, lots of Velcro to attach different devices and screens. You can go on the Picasso page and get really good images of this. Now, the reason this, I would consider this a portable device is because it's not really something you could put in your pocket like the handheld scanner I have in front of me. The first thing I really want to get into is 2.4 gigahertz video scanning tips and techniques because I find it it's the most fun. Now the thing about 2.4 gigahertz is it also requires the most bandwidth. Now bandwidth for radio is similar to bandwidth with your computer. Now Wi-Fi takes up a moderate amount of bandwidth, I think 5 kilohertz per channel. Uh, I do believe Bluetooth takes up about the same if not less wireless audio and video can take up to five or six megahertz so it needs a wider frequency to transmit so if you go back a couple of episodes and look at the um at the segment Ophidian did on the Wi-Spy wireless 2.4 gigahertz wireless spectrum analyzer he actually shows you what happens when you have a 2.4 gigahertz camera operating in the 2.4 gig band while you have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth it actually eats up a very big part of the spectrum 
So, I've got the laptop here, and I've got my handheld scanner, and I've got this really cool tripod base. It's actually for a, an X10 security camera, and with a remote control, I actually can remote control and precisely position a biquad or whatever antenna. I prefer the biquads. They have a relatively uh, decent amount of gain for their size. They're easy to make. They have a very wide amount of bandwidth, and um, they're really easy to mount this stuff. I, Go watch the biquad segment. I, biquads have to be my favorite so far. So with this little setup, I can actually waterproof my biquad and put this little guy outside, and I can actually uh, program in four different positions. So if you run your coax to your to your Wi-Fi card, I've actually got my Wi-Fi card right here. You waterproof everything, and you can put this outside. And the tripod base is waterproof. You can go ahead and put it outside, and if you actually don't feel like getting off your couch, if you have a computer per se and not a laptop. You can run the coax into your house and then pre-program in four different positions of really good signal strength. So, you know, every once in a while, if you want to go and get a couple of extra megs of download for your torrents, all you got to do is push a single button. It'll tune into the access point, and you're good to go. But pretend I didn't say that. But anyway, let's get to the wireless video scanning tips and techniques, shall we? Yes, we shall. Whether you like it or not, we're going to. All right, so in front of us, we have a screen capture of what I'm seeing on screen right now. We've got the rubber duck antenna. Now, this has been modified. Uh, I really don't have any pictures of it, but if you need them, I can provide them. This is actually a Swan 2.4 gigahertz uh, wireless video receiver. Uh, pretty much it's a baby monitor. That's usually what they sell them as. Uh, they're relatively expensive, uh, ranging into $250, but they're actually very nice to have. They're handheld and they're portable. And as I move the antenna around, you'll notice that we have something on channel 1. But seeing how we only have a rubber duck antenna, we have, uh, we don't get a very good signal. If you notice on the screen, you can kind of see that there's some structure to the video. It's not straight and pure static. Now, if we go to another channel, the static will change slightly. Now, I do have a camera on channel 3, which is a picture of a plush rabbit in my bedroom. And if you notice, we got a lot of these really awkward horizontal bars on the screen that are acting as interference. That's actually Wi-Fi. That is the telltale sign that this is picking up Wi-Fi. And if I haven't seen it already, uh, video will take up a larger amount of bandwidth. If you go back to Ophidian's segment, where he demonstrated the Y-Spy, he actually shows you on a graph, an actual spectrum equalizer, of how much bandwidth a video actually takes up. So when selecting the proper antenna, I prefer biquads. The reason I like biquads is they're easy to make, they're relatively inexpensive, they're durable, you can waterproof them. They're just really my favorite antenna so far. However, um, as you go through the channels, if you notice how this channel, channel 4, oops, channel 4 will actually have um, diagonal hum bars, as I call them. So this is just a real clusterfuck of Wi-Fi as well as video. So I'm actually going to go and swap out to the biquad antenna real quick. And uh, normally, all you get without the antenna, this, this would be normal static. This is what you'd normally see. As you start to get close to, the, um, to an actual transmitter, you'll actually notice some structure starting to actually tune in to the screen. And it really depends on the refresh rate of your screen. Now, the capture card has a very hard time picking up static. So if I go through this, you'll notice that the hum bars on the screen, it looks like you're almost trying to pick up a TV channel, but you're not quite. And if you look at this one, where I have the, the biquad positioned, you'll just faintly notice that there are actually uh, two tail lights and a license plate. This is an a the channel one on this is actually uh, to a, uh, someone's, uh, one of my local neighbor's driveway. This is where he parks his car. So if we actually go off center access, you'll notice that it'll start to fade away. And then if we go back, it'll fade in. And this is one of the tips that you really should try to use with wireless video scanning. That every time that a, a signal will reflect off of a metal surface, its phase will actually rotate 90 degrees. So usually that's why I take a helical antenna when video scanning. In fact, let's hook up the helical and see what kind of, what kind of signal we get from the helical indoors. So when doing video scanning, the biquad is nice and small, but typically the helicals will actually yield a better gain. 
but it really determines on what kind of environment that you're in. If you're in a cityscape like I am, you're probably better off using a helical as it's circular polarized. However, the biquad does have a wider bandwidth, meaning it can receive a larger range of bandwidth of actual frequency at once. So, let's see if we can try to tune this in real quick. I really don't think we're going to hit it with this antenna indoors. So, unfortunately, this antenna doesn't have as much bandwidth. If you notice that we're getting a much crisper, clearer signal from my bedroom, and the Wi-Fi is barely negligible. I mean, we can get a, a much wider sweep with the helical, but there's something on channel 4 around here, but I'm not getting a good signal in, indoors. And unfortunately, this is why I actually wanted to go out and do this, so I can actually show you in-field segments and, uh, and tips and techniques. So when doing video scanning, you have to understand that uh, your signal will reflect and bounce off of metal surfaces, so you have to have an antenna that will pick up reflected signals easier. So I would go with the biquad or helical. The compact collinear really doesn't have enough bandwidth or enough gain to really pick up anything. Um, it works, but it, it's a bit better than a rubber duck. Um, you could actually use one of the windsurfers, which I have here, but it's, it's taken apart. You can use the, the windsurfer parabolic reflector and put that around the rubber duck, but I, I find that these things are too flimsy. You're better off building a biquad itself. Now, when you're actually doing wireless video scanning t uh, technique, uh, wear headphones and try to key in your audio. And what you'll notice is the audio carrier will actually fade from static to actual structured you know, audio. You'll actually hear it coming in sooner than you'll see it. But the thing with that is you can either have a 6.5 megahertz carrier or a 6 megahertz carrier. This is a 6.5 megahertz carrier. The one that I have in the bedroom, the camera that's transmitting, is 6 megahertz. So unfortunately, you do not pick up audio on this thing if it's off the, off the center carrier. Now, these are just a few of the tips and techniques for video scanning. It's really an art form to it. Uh, you can even use your body as a reflector when you're using a rubber duck so the radio signals will actually reflect off of your body. Or you can actually keep it close to your body and act as an attenuator. Your body will absorb the radio waves, so unless you're right on top of the transmitter, you're not going to get a signal. So, uh, well, that's it for wireless video. Um, i got to go and turn off the camera because it's going to interfere with the rest of the project. So let me cut frame and reset up, and next we'll get into Bluetooth. All right, so Metatron, a couple of episodes, showed us some Linux tools and utilities for scanning for Bluetooth, including BT Scanner. Unfortunately, I don't have the setup to do screen captures from Linux at the moment, but I did want to show you something pretty cool. Now, I'll actually narrate now, but I'll put the camera up to the phone and I'll show you. If you have a Motorola phone, in fact, my girlfriend has an LG LX or LG uh, 10,000 Voyager, and it actually has something similar to a program called BT Scanner, which, like I said, Metatron has showed us. And it'll actually scan for Bluetooth devices and actually show their device names and their features. Bluetooth scanning in itself is actually a very technical thing and it's very difficult to do. You have to have a, a very good understanding of Bluetooth in itself. Devices can actually be in a client mode or master mode or slave mode. You have uh, SCO links and there's a lot of abbreviations and there's profiles and there's protocol. But if you just want to do some scanning, uh, go to your phone and open it up. Go to the phone book and go to any contact whatsoever and go to send and when you hit select for the send it's going to ask you to turn your bluetooth on if it's not already on and i would recommend turning your bluetooth off at all times until you want to use it and go to look for devices and your phone will actually scan through the bluetooth frequencies i believe that there's 79 of them uh, and it'll actually look for devices now i'm actually going to go back to the computer real quick and do some screen caps off the off the wireless video scanner. And I want to show you something that's pretty cool. So let me hit record real quick. So we got plain static, and now I'm going to look for devices. And you can hear the Bluetooth scanning. And now it's stopped. I'll hit scan one more time.
And you'll also notice that on your screen you'll get a whole bunch of horizontal lines. These horizontal lines are actually the video scanner trying to pick up as video the digital data of the Bluetooth. Now, Bluetooth, on average, will not break more than 2 milliwatts of output power. There are three classes of Bluetooth. Uh, class 1, 2, and 3 uh, is either 1 watt, 5 watt, or 10, sorry, 1, millil uh, 1 milliwatt, 3 milliwatt, or 10 milliwatt. So when you're buying a Bluetooth dongle to mod, uh, try to go and get a class 1 device as it will have the highest power output. And also try to look for something with a CSR radio chipset or the Cambridge Silicon Radio. Reason being is their radio chipset really kicks ass. It's the Blue Core Bluetooth chipset and it's highly hackable and highly moddable. As for antennas with the Bluetooth, waveguides are really nice. I actually built this one uh, in an earlier segment where the Bluetooth is directly hardwired into the waveguide. It's relatively portable. Normally what I'll do is I'll fold the legs to the tripod back and I'll throw this in my backpack right over my shoulder and I'll just leave my laptop scanning in my backpack. Uh, or you can actually hold it like so and scan. When you go out and scan, uh, location, location, location. The best places to go and scan are where there are the most people. Busy intersections, places where there's a lot of traffic, highway overpasses, coffee shops, uh, train stations, uh, Grand Central Station or Penn, Pennsylvania Station or Union Square here in New York City are some of the hot spots that we like to go and scan. Every once in a while we'll go to a coffee house where there's a, a four-way, six-lane in each direction street where there's a lot of traffic and around rush hour people will actually uh, have a lot of bottlenecking in, in the cross sections and people are sitting with their Bluetooth headsets and their Bluetooth phones and even their Bluetooth cars and you can use things like Red Fang, Car Whisper, or even just BT Scanner while sitting on the corner at a local shop sipping a cup of coffee or whatever you like to drink. And um, that's about that. I really wouldn't go as far as hooking up a helical antenna to a Bluetooth device as they're just too bulky and Bluetooth devices tend to be relatively small. Now there is a lot of relative naughtiness that you can do with Bluetooth devices, especially with hands-free headsets. And using the CSR chipset, uh, there are utilities that you can use to actually do packet sniffing under Bluetooth, but that's still something I'm trying to learn myself. I've been studying the Bluetooth protocol quite a bit, and it's very, relatively difficult, but it's really fun once you actually get a hold of it. So uh, the next runner-up is Wi-Fi, and I left this for last because there's actually a lot to say about this. Now, when it comes to Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi typically has 11 channels in the United States, 14 in the UK, and I think Japan. Now, again, my personal favorite antenna for Wi-Fi is the Biquad. Helical antennas are really awesome for long-range shootouts. The thing is, you got to keep them short. You can't make them as long. You can only maybe make about 3.5 decibel gain helical antennas if you want to put it on the end of a dish. I do believe, now correct me if I'm wrong, the longest Wi-Fi shootout was almost 225 miles. First was about 190, but the team that, uh, I think either the same team or another team, went out and actually made a two, almost a 250 mile uh, link using over-the-counter equipment. Really, nothing but laptops, satellite dishes, a couple of helical antennas, and some Wi-Fi cards, over-the-counter stuff. Now, when you're scanning for Wi-Fi, uh, the thing with NetStumbler, it's a great program. However, it's really not that good if you just want to get a signal report. NetStumbler was designed for war driving, and kudos to the creator for, for NetStumbler. I've had many years of fun with it. However, it has not been updated in years, so a lot of modern cards will not work with NetStumbler. And according from what I've seen uh, on the developer's blog and on the forums, they have no intent in updating it whatsoever. There is little to no Vista support at all, and there's no intentions in getting Vista to work uh, with NetStumbler. So NetStumbler is cool for war driving. Is there a better application? Maybe. There's Kismet. Now Kismet runs on Linux. Kismac, if you're running OS X. There are also other applications for war driving and wireless scanning, which I'll put on the forums, but I'm not much of a Mac person, so I can't help you there. So I'll get some advice from everyone else. So NetStumbler is really cool. Unfortunately, trying to navigate through NetStumbler while holding a laptop in one hand with a touchpad isn't really the best to get signal reports. Kismet, for Linux, doesn't really give you the actual signal strength reports. It doesn't give you a chart. So 
Kismet versus NetStumbler. What's better? Really, my opinion, the right tool for the right job. If you want to go war driving, Kismet, NetStumbler. NetStumbler is what we call an active scanner. It'll actively ping. It'll transmit and say, hey, any Wi-Fi out there? Which is bad, because anyone with common sense can detect NetStumbler. In fact, Kismet can actually detect NetStumbler. So when I'm running Kismet and someone's war driving around my neighborhood, it actually says, someone with NetStumbler is trying to ping your network. So, Kismet's a passive scanner, but getting it to work under Linux, you have to have some Linux savvy. I mean, myself, I can get it working these days, but three years ago, it was a real pain in the ass. So if you can get, if you get Backtrack 2 or 3 with a compatible Wi-Fi card, that's great. Now, we've actually modified the Linksys WUSB 54G cards on the show. They're really great cards. In fact, I'm selling them pre-modded with bi-quads and cables and stuff. And I honestly didn't think people would actually give a crap until I got more and more requests for them. What's really cool about this card is it's Linux compatible, OS X compatible, Vista compatible, XP compatible. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with NetStumbler because the driver database hasn't been updated in three years. So even though you have a Wi-Fi card, even if it's brand new and kick-ass, it might not work with NetStumbler because it's just an old program. Albeit it's great, it's obsolete. A better program, if you just really need to get signal reports and really not do war driving, is Insider. Insider is actually made by MetaGeek, the same company that created uh, uh, the Y-Spot. And it'll actually give you a live bar graph, or sorry, a live line graph display of all of the active wireless activity in the area. It's not the fastest in the world. It has absolutely no war driving capabilities whatsoever but it will work with any card that is either Windows XP or Vista compatible. So, if you really just want to do signal reports, which is something I like to do a lot, I really don't care about actually mapping the area. Um, I really care more about trying to figure out where the actual access points are coming from. I'll use Insider over NetStumbler, mainly for ease of use and the fact that it actually works with my hardware. Now, you can also get PCMCA cards, but trying to get PCMCA cards that work under Linux can not only be tedious, but it's a roll of the dice. Uh, if you want to get something under Linux, you got to make sure that the chipset inside of the actual circuitry is supported under Linux. These days, it's relatively easy. Unfortunately, if you're completely new to Linux, the chances of you getting a supported Wi-Fi card out of the box from your local retail store, you might as well just go and smash yourself in the side of the head with a ball-peen hammer to try to get it to work. Really, you have to know intimate details about your hardware. Now, when you're doing wire, uh, Wi-Fi scanning, you have to understand that in some states, this equipment in some countries, uh, I know they have some really strict laws out in the Germany and UK now, some of this equipment could be illegal. Um, I know in some states, just possession of a waveguide or a cantenna will actually get you a weekend in jail just for having it. It's considered conspiracy to commit uh, computer fraud or wiretapping or, or whatever. So check your local laws. Now, um, there is a lot more to this. I really don't know what I'm forgetting, besides what antennas to use under Wi-Fi. If you're war driving and you want to have an omnidirectional field of view, I'd definitely go with the compact collinear. Um, I actually have some, some of these suction cup clamps. They're pretty cool. Um, they're literally clamps that have suction cups on them, and they fit onto the, uh, onto the compact collinear perfectly. So I can actually put this suction cupped to the side of the window of a vehicle, or even a moving train, if so need be, and then wire this directly into my Wi-Fi card to go and get a signal report. Now, again, the bi-quad is my favorite of all antennas, but you might want to fool around with the waveguide on, wave on this one. Unfortunately, I found that trying to build a waveguide can be a fairly difficult thing to do because not too many people have the skill to drill a hole in a round surface. Again, the bi-quad is a really fun antenna. Now, if you really want, like I said, if you want to do really long-range shootouts, use two helical antennas that are polarized in the same direction, either left, uh, left hand coil or right hand coil. Uh, the actual uh, driven element, the actual receiving spiral of wire. Uh, watch the segment and you'll understand. Uh, reason being is, instead of being horizontally or vertically polarized, it's circular polarized in the exact same phase no matter what. So you don't have to worry about the signal actually reflecting or, or bouncing off of anything. And because only those two signals on that frequency actually are rotating in the same direction, they'll really only want to see each other rather than everything around them. Now, uh, the Wi-Fi channels do actually overlap. Now, I would highly recommend, if you're going to install any kind of Wi-Fi device, at least run Insider, NetStumbler, Kismet, or Kismac, or even get your PDA or your MDA 
and scan for local Wi-Fi access points just to see what's in the local area. Walk around the block a couple of times. There are some really cool applications for the Pocket PC as well as the uh, Linux uh, handheld devices and the MDA and things of the such. I'll put into the show notes. We've really covered this in the past, though. And get a site survey of what's going on in your area and make sure you're not operating on a channel that is actually in use or even being overlapped with another frequency. I'll actually put up a, a chart of the Wi-Fi frequency so you have a better idea. I'll also put it in the show notes, the, the exact same graphic I'll be using. So these are just some of the tips and techniques. Um, whenever you're dealing with any kind of these devices, you've got to make sure that you always have enough battery power because the last thing you want to do is have a battery malfunction out in the field. You go out to uh, what you'd think to be a very uh, wonderful day of scanning for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and wireless video just to find out that when you get to the area that you want to scan, you wind up running out of battery power or your batteries are not holding a charge properly. And I was hoping by now we would actually do another physical hacking segment, but time and weather and health have been preventing a lot of us from getting together and doing it. But remember what I've said in episode one. This is why I said what, what I said in episode one. Mustang and I covered dressing elite. You don't want to go into a shitty neighborhood or even a good neighborhood at 2 o'clock in the morning carrying this kind of equipment around by yourself. It doesn't matter how good or how rich hoity-toity upper class your neighborhood is. The bottom line is there might be someone lurking in the shadows waiting to go and put a knife in your gut to go and take your stuff. And that's the bottom line. So I hope this is it. I'm going to try to composite what I can together. I know I'm forgetting a lot. There's just a, really a lot to cover with this. But really, go out and about and experiment. That's what this is all about. Just remember, go out, be safe, go out as a group, go out often, and stay in public areas. I guarantee you that you'll find a lot of fun stuff in the 2.4 gigahertz field. And I really hope this series of segments have enlightened you and, and, and entertained you and educated you in getting involved in not only just 2.4 gigahertz wireless, but wireless in general, because coming up soon, we're getting into amateur radio and some other cool shit. So if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to add anything to this, even if you want to do your own little tutorial video, that uh, including your own experiences, maybe do some kind of blog or whatever, hit me up on IRC. Show notes are always on the forums. Forums are always open for discussion, as well as IRC. Let us know your adventures out in the wireless world. We want to hear them. All right, everyone. Good luck. Have fun. Be safe.